Hey guys, it's Leanna, and I'm here today to talk about my new favorite book, The Wolf by Leo Carew. If you follow me on Instagram, then you'll know that I've been freaking out about this book because it is like the literal greatest thing ever. I talked to my TBR about how the way this book looked, it looks like it should be my new favorite book, and I was more right than I could ever have even imagined. I am completely gobsmacked, so I probably shouldn't be filming this yet because I barely finished it, so I'm still kind of processing how blown away I am by this, but we're doing it because I want to talk about it and it's amazing and you should read it right now. So briefly, kind of what is this book about and then what makes it so amazing? So this book, it takes place, it's a fantasy in the sense of the way that the Conqueror Saga is fantasy. Uh, it's an alternate history fantasy. So it's not a magic system. It's not a magical new world that doesn't exist. It's our own, like, Earth world um, in the Dark Ages, but it's an, uh, a reimagined history where instead of just our own Homo sapien humanoid species having survived through the Ice Age into the Dark Ages, other humanoid species also survived. So, like, what if Neanderthal had not died out? What if other humanoid species like that had survived long enough to form language and culture and be players in, you know, our history and politics. So um, if you like look at the map in this book, um, it, it's showing like Britain, but it's everything is renamed and reimagined, but that's where it's taking place in our own world, but as if we were not the only ones to survive. Most of the story is told, is an omniscient narrator, but most of it is told from the perspective of um, the Anakim. And the Anakim are these sort of more developed Neanderthal type uh, species, culture, people. You do also see the sort of human side of things. Those are the Southerners. And there is a sort of a main protagonist on that end of things that you do sort of check in with. And you do see that side of things as well. But most of the story, page count, word count wise, is told from the perspective of the Anakim. And... Basically, the story has a very Viking Norse feel. It's a very harsh climate. The Anakim have a their their diet and their culture and their living circumstances is very reminiscent of like a Viking inspired world, which obviously is my jam. If you follow me at all, like anything remotely Viking related, I'm like yes, please. But they're obviously they're not Vikings. They're their own thing. They're a completely different species, and it's. Uh, Again, yeah, they're not Vikings, but it has that kind of feel. I mean, they drink mead and birch wine and they eat, you know, like lingonberries and they drink out of horns and it's a very earthy kind of vibe. They're very large uh, people. They're very large creatures. They're much, much larger than the our ancestors of Southerners. Uh, they're more long lived. They live like 200 years on average. They're not, you know, immortal like elves or anything. They just live longer. Uh, they're physically larger. They live longer. They have other natural adaptations that help them survive in this harsher climate um, that the book kind of goes into. Um, but so they are physically different. And that is all very well explained and very well thought out. And it is largely based on this author's research into like how Neanderthals were different. And I mean, some of it is invention, but it's sort of a an extension of what might have happened had they continued to evolve. Yeah, so it follows. Um, it's basically a giant war story. The Southerners, like our own ancestors, wanting to invade and take over everywhere. And the Anakim are physically larger and stronger, but they're not invaders. So in that sense, they're very un-Viking. Uh, the Vikings went around raiding all the time, um, invading other lands. The Anakim, they are very content with their own land. They just want to protect their own land. Um, which is being invaded by the Southerners. And they don't want to expand, but they want to protect what is theirs. So again, it just follows the all of the politics within the Anakim culture and society um, as these war games play out, as well as some of the politics going on on the Southern end of things and about why they're invading and who's invading and who's doing what. So it's a very political, war-centric type of story with a lot of Nordic vibes. Okay, but so... From that description, you're like, okay, and that sounds decent. Sounds like a pretty good fantasy book. Doesn't sound that out of the ordinary. Why is this so special? And it's the world building. The world building is insanely, amazingly, intricately developed. And when I say that, if I heard myself say that, I would interpret that to mean something really dry, where it's just listing constantly tons of facts and details, just throwing info dumping exposition at you with, here's what they call this, and here's how they do this, and here's their structure for this, and it's not like that at all. Not at all. There is some of that, obviously, any fantasy book has some info dumping to get you sort of, 
you know, into the world, but not very much at all in this book. The world building is just built into the fabric of how these people live and interact with each other and, and how they go about things. Um, and I was so blown away by how, how lifelike it felt, that it felt like a piece of history rather than a, a creative fantasy, um, that I looked up the author because um, this is his debut, which just, let me just give up on life right now. He was a bioanthro major. And I was a cultural anthro major, but I had to take some bioanthro classes. But as soon as I read that about him, it clicked why this book is just so miles in a way different. And I don't know for everyone, but definitely for me, it's approaching things from a lens that I understand and that it, I feel is superior, but maybe it's just it's my, it's my preference. To me, world building in the best fantasy books can often fall flat and feel quite lifeless, which is kind of strange because to me, a world is defined by the life within it. And this book approaches things from a very anthropological perspective, where the way that the culture is built, it doesn't feel like it's just like sort of a creative thought exercise of what if a culture was structured like this? Um, I mean, it is a bit that way, but because obviously this whole thing is a massive thought exercise of what if Neanderthal had survived? But it's really just, it's this sense of he's literally just sat there and asked what if questions until a culture was formed. And it's perfect for that reason. So everything is taken into consideration. How this biology of these these other creatures would affect the way that they, like physically, the, the ramifications of physically being different, how that would manifest itself in culture, how that would manifest itself in what they value and how they interact in how they structure things, in, in everything. So that is seamless. It is absolutely seamless. And the, the literal differences that um, he's researched into how Neanderthals are different in terms of their their inability to maybe understand symbols the way that we do. And isn't necess that doesn't mean they're dumber than us. It doesn't mean they're more simplistic. It's just not how they're wired. And so their culture would necessarily reflect that. And again, the way this is done, you don't have a narrator saying oh, they, these are Neanderthals and they can't understand symbols and therefore they do things differently. They do it like this. No, it's just built into their society. The way that they record history is more, is reliant on oral history, is more reliant on memory, is shared memory. Um, they are more long lived. So there's more, there's a longer period to be able to spend memorizing and recording it in that way. Um, and they, they do have symbols. They do have some rudimentary kind of, I don't want to say written language, but written form of communication, but it's not their strong suit necessarily. And there's just so many details in terms of how they would be different from us. And it feels real. It feels so real. And even though they're very distinctly different from, from you or I or from the Southerners, which would be uh, who we would be descended from, because, well, we do spend most of the book with the Anakim, so you're necessarily more invested in their side of things because you're with them more. But just in the way that when I studied anthropology, a lot of um, things that if you just heard about a practice by itself or a culture, just a fact about it, you would dismiss as being barbaric or primitive. But upon reading a really in-depth um, description, a really in-depth ethnography about who these people are, why they do this, what led them to do this, how that, you know, ties into their cultural identity, and you might still, like objectively say, okay, this is a barbaric thing to do. It is a violent thing to do, but it's not just that. Like there is a logic behind it. It makes sense. And these people are just savages. Like they, it makes sense what they're doing in a very, very complex cultural way. So the Anakim are quite violent. This whole book is very violent. I mean, the Southerners are violent as well, most definitely. Um, but they're not just these barbaric others. <laughs> they, uh, they have very distinct values, very distinct cultural system cultural hierarchy and what they do makes sense for them. And it makes sense to you as the reader as you're going through it because you really get a sense for it. It's not just being told to you that this is what they value, so they're doing this. Like, you really feel their connection to their own value system and their own worldview uh, in everything, in what they, in, in just how they approach everything, what they value and what they're, what they're willing to sacrifice for, live for, fight for, live for, etc. Um, and where this becomes most apparent, how it, how anthropological it is, and I, the anthropology major in me literally gobbled this up, is that the Southerner, who is the main antagonist, who is, who is the sort of engine behind this invasion, he's approaching the invasion from a very anthropological perspective. 
Um, and I mean, anthropology was born from the fact that the British Empire needed to understand the cultures it was invading in order to invade them. So that's what this guy is doing. He needs to learn about the Anakim if they're going to invade, because to un- you have to understand your enemy, essentially. So he is studying the Anakim, and he wants to figure out what they think and feel and what they call things and how they understand things so that he can invade them better. And so that does help the reader to understand. But just that whole approach is he's not just saying, you know, where are they going to attack and where is their main force and I need to destroy their weapons. And that's obviously important and that's covered as well because it's a very war centric book. But he's taking the time to learn about nuances in their language about how they have words for things that we don't, and why would they have these words, and what these words means to them, and what that says about what they value, and how that's going to inform how they react to an invasion. And it's fucking phenomenal. I just don't have other words for it. This is the best built thing that I think I've ever read. The story is fantastic. It's on par with Game of Thrones. It's on par with, you know, whatever, epic battle-centric you know, fantasy. But it's the building of the culture and, and, and belief systems of the people here is just so seamless and perfect. And it's, I just, I, it feels real. Like nothing these characters does falls outside of what you come to understand as being their culture. It, it's all part of it. They never act outside of what you've come to understand as being their culture. And it feels so real for that reason. What they do, even if it's even at times kind of hard to identify with because they are distinctly different from, you know, from you or I. You understand what they're, where they're coming from and why they're doing it. And it makes sense. And it, it's just, it feels real. And I am blown away. Just blown away. So yeah, um, I highly, highly, highly recommend this book. Um, it's just, it's just so, so good. Like, obviously, the anthro nerd in me is is loving it. But even if you're not into anthropology, I can't imagine that you'd read this and not appreciate on some level the intricacy of the world building, the intricacy of the culture building. And I cannot wait for the next book. And if this is his debut, this is his first book. Oh my god. He better write some more is all I gotta say about that. So yeah, let me know in the comments down below how you feel about world building. Um, if what I've just sort of been describing and oozing about appeals to you, if that's what you look for in world building, what your experience with good or bad world building has been, if I've piqued your interest, or if you have already read this, I'd love to talk about this book specifically, but uh, let me know your thoughts about anything and everything in the comments down below, and I'll see you in my next video.